1 p.m. here in Brazil. Uh, Lucas Simone, you can't. Yes. Você não consegue it's my country, it's no. It's no starting live in YouTube, yes. Yeah, we're live, but that, that's just for people who, who can't get this to work. It's not public on YouTube, don't worry. Okay. It's a close link. It's just for, okay. for people who okay. subscribe to the event. Um, Okay, let me try to fix the problem Lucas is having. Um, veja se resolveu, Lucas. Leandro, você escuta a gente? A gente não te escuta, Leandro. Problem solved. Eu tô mudo, eu sou um imbecil. Oh. Agora eu percebi. <laughs> Okay. Hello, Luca. Pleasure. Hello, Bedri. Yeah. Please to yes. meet you. He hello, hello for you. Hello. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, How are you? Fine. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Leandro Sousa Santana Neves, and I'll be presenting with you too. It, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in your work. It, it really seems mm -hmm. great. You know, in Brazil, we barely even have the notion that. Kosovo exists because no one talks ah. about it. So. <laughs> now you you will hear something that uh, show that who was Kosovo in in medieval in medieval age. Yeah, but Brazil mostly that time, they think at it, the... that time it's called Dardania. At that time in Middle Age and ancient, the the uh, now in the territory of Kosovo was called Dardania. 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 And it's part, it's part of Albanian territory. Mm -hmm. It's part of Albanian territory. That's cool. Here in Brazil, we tend to think that Middle Ages only exists in Portugal, in France, and in England. So no one talks about anything else, which is a well. shame. <laughs> <laughs> When it's time to start, uh, I'm ready. Okay, uh, we're missing. Let me see who we're, who we're missing because we're not going to wait. Uh, let's wait like one or two minutes. Leandro, okay, uh, okay. you're muted again, I think. Okay. So we're not hearing you if you're talking at all. Um, uh, let me see who, we're, who are we missing because we're not going to wait a long for them let's give me let's give them uh it's jose iveson jose iveson marques ferreira um if if you are here please uh give us a sign or something <laughs> because if not we're waiting five minutes only so once that clock hits five, I'm opening the session officially, and then I will just do the, uh, a few reminders, which I'm actually going to do now. So quick reminders to everyone. Uh, this session, all the papers are in English, so we don't have to worry a lot about that here. Um, but during the Q&A, if you want to ask a question in Portuguese or Spanish, uh, the organization will be here to help with the translation. So if you're not comfortable speaking English, you can use one of those other two languages. Um, the other thing is we need to be strict with time because after this session, the other one will start at the exact moment. So there is no tolerance for delays. Everyone has 15 minutes to speak and then we have debate afterwards. Uh, if, if the other person who is missing doesn't come up, uh, we can have a longer debate, but let's just increase the debate. Let's not talk for any longer than that for organization's sake. Um, if you want to share screen or any documents, the panelists can do that. And if you, yeah, if you have any issues, let us know. We can, we can share your slides for you if you have any trouble. And yeah, that's it. So let's just wait 
uh, two more minutes uh, and you can, and we can start. Uh, Leandro, está habilitado agora, sim. Uh, Lucas, perdão. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ok, so last call for José Ivson Marques Ferreira de Lima. If you are here, uh, say something. Otherwise, we're going to start the panel without you because you're not here as a panelist. And we have no way to, of knowing. Oh, ok, José Ivson has just connected. Perfect. Let's just wait for him to connect and then we can start. I will pass moderation to Leandro. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Luis. Welcome all, good afternoon, good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. My name is Leandro Cesar Santana Neves. Due to extraordinary circumstances, I'll be moderating this table about non-Western medievalism as well as presenting after Betri. And I'm gonna, first of all, thank the organization, thank Luis for this wonderful event and possibility to talk, and also thank Professor Vinicius Dreger, Professor Robson de la Torre from Unimontes, and also the leader of the group of studies of Medieval history, Carolina Rocha. I'm gonna now talk in Portuguese for a moment, so I can welcome you all, and then we'll pass to Pedro's presentation. Então, boa tarde agora, para os brasileiros, uma hora da tarde, ou bom dia, boa noite, não importa onde você esteja. Meu nome é Leandro Cesa Santana Neves, e extraordinariamente eu terei que ser o monitor dessa mesa, não que não seja uma alegria imensa fazer tal, mas eu também serei um apresentador. Então, nós estamos aqui na primeira mesa do evento Global Medievalism, Medievalismo Global, intitulada Medievalismos Não Ocidentais. Então, assim que eu acabar de falar em português, eu passarei a palavra para Berim Mudari. E é isso, temos 15 minutos todos, eu vou pedir para, para mim também a organização seja rigorosa com o tempo, não quero causar nenhum constrangimento. E é isso. Uh, now we're going to start this conference with Bedri Muhadri. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, from the Institution of History Al Hadri from Kosovo, presenting the conference entitled The Tendency of Serbian Historiography Towards Medieval History in Kosovo, a theme that I can assure you all just by hearing it very interesting. So, Bedri, you can start 15 minutes and then go. Okay, okay. Hello, I thank you for your... It's... Are you ready? Yes, hello? Can. Oh, hello, you can, you can read your paper, Bedri. Oh, okay, okay. Hello again for you. Uh, the tendency of Serbian historiography towards medieval history in Kosovo. The treatment of ethnic and demographic aspects in Kosovo during the medieval period, we have based on documents of the time, Slavic source gifts, chrysobulus or golden balls as deeds, diplomas of Serbian monasteries of 1330 and 13. 48 are legal acts on data property which enables the treatment of demographic ethnic aspects. Although important, they themselves are deficient, inclusive by their very legal nature as they have not been extensively recorded. They provide information only on the assets and interest of the monasteries that were dedicated to them as property for us. Despite the lack of the that characteristic gifts, they bring report, reports that testify to the continued presence of the Albanian population in Kosovo before 15 centuries. The onomastic basis that brought 
this information are numerous. In these documents, we have a number of names that belong to the Atec Finnish Arborian language, such as Jin, Det, Bard, Guri, Muzaka, etc. Although this number is very small in number in Slavic documents, well known scholars such as Shufla, Yericek, Spudaha, and Ternava from Kosovo. Explicitly say that we, we are delaying, dealing with the ethnic Arab community in Kosovo before the Ottoman period. Serbian historiography based on the fragmentary information of the source and ignoring the historical circumstances of the time. Tries to find in this that in Kosovo in pre-Ottoman times lived only the Serb population completely completely denying 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 the Arabian substratum in the Middle Ages, claiming that Albanian in Kosovo came quite late in the century of 17. Albanian historiography in its research on Slavic documents, despite the lack of the the data, data brings reports that testify to the continuous presence of the Albanian population in Kosovo during the Slavic rule by the Nemanjic dynasty in the first place that code of Dushan, Dushan in the year 1349 mentioned the Arbanas inhabitants of these lands as well as the diploma of Dechan, Dechan of 1330, and that of this monastery, monastery of the Sanch Mihal and Gabriel, 1348, in prison, testified to the presence of arbors in towns and villages, villages of Kosovo. Albanian historiography manage, manages to re reject the, the thesis of Serbian scholars proving at the Theni of the Arbarian Arber, Arber, population in the territory of Dardania, Kosovo, from an antiquity to the Middle Age, that the Arbor population of Autochthonos in, in large numbers is provided by Ottoman source. In this regard, source of primary importance are the catastal register of the detailed type. Mufasal Deftelari, such as the registration of the Brankovic Vilayet 4, 1455, the register of San Jacob Skodra 1485 of Dugajin 1571, drafted by the Ottoman occupation administration in the middle of the 15th and 16th century for the territory of Kosovo. The information of this Defters are richer in many aspects, such as economic, social, but also of demographic and the ethnic, ethnic character. Their information are complete for, from a territor territorial point of view, including almost the entire territory, entire territory of Kosovo. They are not limited to a few villages or properties. Studies and comparisons on Slavic and Ottoman documents show that the Arbarian, Arbarian population that turns out to be the attack fence in the territory of Kosovo due to historical circumstances during the period of foreign rules such as Slavic, Bulgarian and Ottoman in a view as a result of Okupier discrimination appropriated Slavic names during the rule of the rules of Russia. This is a clearly evidence by facts when we have Slavic names which appear, appear with Arborian such as Radoslav, son of Jin. This, these facts are numerous that are documented through Ottoman source. Albanian historiography manages to re reject Serbians, this is on the population of Kosovo with Albanian from the presence of our 
were in the entire territory of Kosovo in villages and towns. The Arbor population turns out to be the large population in Kosovo, along with immigration elements, mainly Slavic, who came during the occupation from the medieval Serbian Nemanic dynasty as colonists and military, as well as minority elements as a result of economic and trade processes such as Ragozans and the SAS. The Battle of Kosovo, 1389, fought in a territory near the city of Pristina between the arms of the Balkan and Ottoman coalitions, was one of the most determined efforts of the Balkans princes to stop the of the Ottoman expansion in the Balkans in the end of the 14th century. Serious preparations from both sides for this battle, the large number of opposing armies, the historical course of the battle before and after it have influenced the Battle of Kosovo to be the most crucial, crucial part of medieval historical studies in the territory of Dardania, ancient Kosovo. Historical source such as Ottoman, Byzantine, Italian, Ragusan, Albanian, Slavic, etc., provide evidence of the participation of some Balkan princes such as Albanians, Croatians, Serbs, Hungarians, Bulgarians, etc. The Ottoman camp led by Sultan Murat I consisted of numerous forces from the empire and its vassals. As a, dinner, as a dramatic event in itself that marked the beginning of the Ottoman con conquests in the Balkan, Balkans, it has long attra attracted the attention of attention of Chronicle historians of the time and many scholars, which has consequently found a relatively broad treatments in the history of the of the peoples of the Balkans. Basic studies mark a character of Balkan importance, especially of special importance for Kosovo. Serbian historiography tries to present this battle as an event only between Serbs against the Ottomans. Serbian historiography and, and its propaganda regarding members of the, of the coalition against the Ottoman states that the battle was attended by Knez Lazar, ruler of the state of Serbian states, ruler of Kosovo, Vuk Brankovic with their armies. In this regard, they were assisted by only by Bosnia from the King Tvrtko I. The, the aim is to present the Serbs as defenders of Europe from the Ottoman, Ottoman occupation at the time. Those, the tendencies are clearly seen that it's only these Serbs who waged were against the Ottoman incursions in the Balkans. At the, uh, at the same time, protecting the Christian population of the Balkans. It is clear that this attitude is a Serbian political tendency, is tendency to present the territory of Kosovo and ancient Serbian land. On the other hand, historical source, such as Ottoman, Byzantine, Latin, and Albanian speak of the participation of some people of, of some population of the Balkan, such as Albanians, Croatian, Hungary, Hungarians, Greeks, Bulgarians, etc. In the Albanian historiography, the Battle of Kosovo has been extensively treated and has given its known results on this issue. Issue: the first battle of Kosovo from the year. 1389 has the character of a broad coalition of forces from both sides. The Balkan forces were composed of feudal, lord, feudal lords in the Balkans who also saw the Ottoman threat to their freedom. 
the Balkan coalition was led by King Lazar Krebilanovich with other Albanian princes such as George Balsha Theodor Muzaka. The Ottoman coalition consists of numerous forces from the emperor and its vassals. These forces were led by Sultan Murat first. Victory was harvested by the Ottoman forces, which marked the beginning of the conquests and rule of the territories in the Balkans. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Bedri. It was a really nice, really nice presentation. I have some doubt questions. He is the I'll, I'll try to get later. I'm sure that other people from the audience also has have a lot of questions. And now we pass to let's see <laughs> myself. Well, I present. I'm gonna speak in Portuguese before. For a bit. Então, agora sou eu, o apresentador. Eu já me apresentei no começo, mas antes de passar para o inglês e repetir, meu nome é Leandro César Santana Neves, eu sou doutorando no quarto ano pelo Programa de Pós-Graduação em História Social da UFRJ. Enquanto eu vou falando, eu vou tentar dividir a tela também. E eu já agradeci muito por questão, e agora eu vou falar em inglês, mas eu já adianto que, apesar do texto não estar em português, é possível que ele saia em um livro um pouco futuramente. Então, dito isso, hello, my name is Leandro Cesar Santana Neves, I'm a PhD student from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, I'm also a member of LATIM, Laboratório de Teoria e História das Mídias Medievais, from UF, UFRJ, UFRJ and USP. And today I'm gonna present you all a work that it's not my main research, however, it's something that I'm currently a lot interested in, which is the relationship between medievalism and media, especially animated movies. And I, I think you can see my presentation now, my slide. I'm gonna read for convenience. And again, I'm gonna ask Luis to annoy me if I'm extrapolating the time. If you follow my reading. It's not new to state that a movie that depicts a historical event can shape the collective memory of its viewers, forming or deforming the historical consciousness and views of the past. This relationship is clear in movies with a relatively younger or family target audience that deal with a theme of utmost importance for their own national identity. In the case of this movie, which will take an example, it is Knyaz Vladimir, an animated movie from 2006 about the earlier life of one, earlier life of one of the most famous Russian and Ukrainian rulers who had its tenure at the end of the 10th century. This movie deals directly with an most important theme for the national identity, the baptizer of one of the founders of their countries. But what medieval Russia are we talking about? First, it might be noted that medieval Russia never existed, just like the Middle Ages itself. What existed was Rus, or Drevnia Rus, from 19th century to either the 13th or 17th century, depending on the historian you ask about the chronology. Not exclusive, but also to the country that made the movie, although not often considered part of the medieval world, Rus, who comprised of parts of Russia, Ukraine, and also Belarus, uh, sorry, I lost myself, has its fair share of researches of its quote unquote medieval past in contemporaneity, the aesthetics that uses and abuses in cultural and political fields in what researchers tend to call medievalism. Hence, the short communication aims to offer some possibilities to analyze a particular movie, which we stated before. A useful concept to help us analyzing the movie's potential as a source for medievalism is one of medievality apparatus, created by historians Newton Pereira and Marcelo Giacomoni 
in the book Possible Pasts, Depictions of Middle Ages in History Teaching, Possíveis Passadas, Representação da Idade Média no Ensino de História. According to the authors, who draw heavy inspiration from Foucault's notion of apparatus or dispositif when analyzing school books, the medievalite apparatus consists of a, consists on a series of statements that, when triggered by certain elements, help to build and to reinforce a certain notion of the Middle Ages in a form of historical consciousness. Applying that to a movie, especially one geared towards a younger audience, there are several elements able to mold the historical consciously or unconscious or not depicted in the writers and directors on other road. With the theoretical basis covered, let's turn out to our main object. Knyaz Vladimir, film Piervi, Knyaz Vladimir, first movie, has fourth KV, it is a traditionally animated, that means hand-drawn, Russian movie from the studio Salnyechny Dom, directed by Yuri Batanin and later by Yuri Kulakov. Released in 2006, this highly fictionalized biography, biographic movie centers around Vladimir Sviatoslavich, who died in 1015, also known with, by the epithets The Great or The Red Sun. Becoming the Emil Knyaz, a title often translated as prince or king, of Kiev after a violent war against his brother, Yarapolk Svetoslavich, and several disputes with both against both earthly enemies, the Pechenegs, and powerful malevolent sorcerer named Krivja, from the Russian kr adjective Krivji, meaning crooked or dishonest, in the year of 980. Vladimir is not the only protagonist, though. There's also a small Russian boy named Alyeksha that serves as a cathartic point to the viewers, reacting to the historical events that happen and helping Vladimir and others and other characters in many situations. Originally planned to be a series of short movies dealing with different processes of conversion in medieval Europe, the movie had an important consultancy from eminent Russian Slavists Dmitry Likhachov and Valentin Yanin, as well as the blessing from the Patriarch of Moscow himself, Alexei II. Furthermore, it was mainly funded by the Russian State Committee of Forced Cinematography, Goskino. KV has the subtitle of first movie because it was planned to be a duology, with the second film being about Vladimir's conversion to Byzantine Christianity in 988. However, the studio went bankrupt in 2007, not helping that the movie was somewhat of a flop, only grossing for 100,000 more than it was made from. Therefore, the promised sequel never happened, even though the script is circulating online nowadays. Aside from the movie itself, useful information for our presentation can be found in the electronic site whose name is displayed in the screen right now, listing concept art, interviews with the cast and creators, and other useful official information. It seems that starting from 2021, the site domain has expired, but we are still able to access it via Wayback Machine feature of archive.org. This presentation focuses on two elements present in the KV that can be helped with our theoretical basis. The first of them being the different ethnic groups depicted in the movie. True to the reality of rules in the 10th century and to the rest of Europe as a whole this time, there are several ethnicities that appear in some way or the other to further the plot. There are four main ethnicities that are grouped in KV, the Slavs portrayed by Vladimir and the Russians and when I mean the Russians, I'm not meaning the current term Russians, but instead the inhabitants of Rus. And clearly the main protagonists, the Byzantine Greeks or Romans as they identified themselves in the sources, the steppe dweller Pechenegs and the Norsemen. Due to time constraints, we'll focus on the latter two. Aside from the Slavs for obvious reasons, the Pechenegs get the most screen time due to their roles as the main antagonists with Krivja, both even working together to destroy Vladimir. This semi-nomadic Turkey population that lived through Eastern Europe and Central Asia were often de depicted in the sources as being great nuisance to the Slavs and the Byzantine Empire. An example can be found in the Povest Vilmnichliet, an analyst compilation that deals with the early history of Rus. In the early entry of 1962, the Knyaz Vyatoslavigarevich is killed by their leader, Kuria, and has his skull turned into a drinking cup. Coincidentally enough, Kuria himself was an important character in the movie, being the sadistic and cruel main military foil to Vladimir, 
who was Sviata Slavson? And the murder is mentioned in Avec during the movie. Avec is like a popular council, somewhat democratic for a time that people think there was no democracy, but in any case, that's returned. The Pechenek leader even appears in the movie using said school cup. Although this information is not present in the KV, we believe that this, it's a so-called Easter egg to remind the audience use it to the poverty narrative through various means. The first picture in this slide is Kuria. He's holding his school cap. He's looking really menacing. I admit it's a really cool pose. <laughs> anyway, the Pechenegs as a whole are depicted as a stereotypical enemies. They're often ruthless attackers and always leave a trail of fire and death, such as in their introduction, where they are responsible for the devastation of Alexia's village and even for the death of his grandfather. Almost all of them have yellowish pale skin, making them discernible from the main Slavs. It's this second picture. If you can see, it seems that it's the same character. I believe this to be recycled animation. It's a very common technique for those, especially who grew up with Hanna-Barbera cartoons and such. The exceptions are Kuria and his advisor, name given by the set. He actually is not called in the whole movie and not even the site. He's only called advisor, Sovietnik. The leader has orange skin and a big hairdo that oscillates between light and dark gray. The advisor, aside from having darker skin tone, has some stereotypical Asiatic traits, such, such as epicantic teeth, those also called as buck teeth, something that especially Westerners did a lot in World War II propaganda. And buck teeth and clothes reminiscent of the Mongols. With a, with a main goal to see doubts between Vladimir and Aropok to ultimately conquer Rus, the Pechenek seemed likely an amalgamation of different steppe people that invaded the Rus and the Russia throughout the ages, such as the Palotians and the Mongols. In fact, such are their roles and national villains that Vladimir Putin himself equated them to COVID-19 in a discourse, quote unquote, our country has been through serious tests more than once. When tormented by the Pechenegs and the Cumans, Russia coped with everything. So they are enemies that are probably implicated in the minds of the Russian people. That's why it was uh, probably the safest choice making them the antagonists of the movie. From the Asian step to Scandinavia, the Norsemen are also somewhat prominent in the KV's plot, or more specifically, one character in particular. Although in the movie he's only referred as a Varangian, that is, a Viking possibly from modern day Sweden that transited and settled in Eastern Europe, Olaf the Redhead, Rigi, as he is known the official site, has an important role in the movie. Based on his official description on the web page and his position as a mercenary working for Vladimir, the Redhead is clearly based on Olaf Trygvason, a Norseman that had the same path as his cartoony company called, quote-unquote, courageous and cruel by the site, Olaf exhibits a lust for money and blood, as he says to Dobrynia, quote-unquote, the sword feeds the vengeance. Also, he speaks in a very menacing, cruel tone. It's like, the sword feeds the vengeance. In this way, sorry for the accent. Due to that, he's easily manipulated by Klivja and becomes a tertiary antagonist. Not only Olaf is different from the Slavs in behavior, but he is also physically distinct. His skin is darker than both the Slavs and the Byzantines. As you can see by the last image here, there's an arrow pointing at Olaf. Although in the site he's shown with the same skin tone, leading us to believe that it was a later development. His hair color and facial features are also distinct from the others. Furthermore, he's constantly referred as the Varangian in the dialogue by other characters, never called by his name Olaf. We know that his name is Olaf because, again, the site uh, has a small mention that his name is that. Olaf's distinction, but still placing Rus, seems to evoke the so-called, quote-unquote, normalist controversy, an academic dispute in which, to briefly summarize, the role of the Varangians in shaping of Rus is discussed. The movie seems to tend towards an anti-normalism, that is, minimizing Norse influences in the composer of the Russian people, therefore excluding Olaf from the rest of the Rus. The second element we'd like to focus on is how the KV treats both of the religious systems that are a big part of the movie. Since, as I said earlier, the movie was blessed by the patriarch himself, 
and was supposed to be about the conversion, it's a given that the Christianity is depicted in a very positive manner. To the point where some reviewers call the movie, quote unquote, ecclesiastic propaganda. The other main character embraces the imperial faith and rescued from the patchnecks by the Byzantine movie-only character Anastasi. Later, the boy is once again saved from the evil step warriors due to a copy of the dog of the Gospels that he was carrying, carrying with him. Yarapolk, Vladimir's brother, is also implied to be secretly a Christian. Before, see, as before his death, he's showing, holding a crucifix and having a memory of their grandmother, Olga famous for being the first converted Russian ruler, Russia. This, this also matches a certain tendency to assume that Yarapolk secret, had a secret Christianity, as the sources said that he had espoused the Greek nun, which coincidentally in the chronicles of Vladimir killed Yarapolk, and then he took his wife from this unholy, as the sources say, union, it was born Sviatapolk the accursed, but we can talk about that in a future occasion. For a movie that has ties with the church, one, of, one would assume that pre-Christian Slavic religion is demonized. After all, Krivja is an evil sorcerer capable of causing, cursing and killing through his magic. That's not the case, however. While Krivja is indeed the main villain, he's far from the only sorcerer. Sorry, I lost myself again. <laughs> or Wolf, which is the Rus name for sorcerers, that appears in the KV. Others are part of the overall plot, having minor voiced parts, but still depicted as helpful and kind. One in particular, Boyan, becomes a prominent character in the second half of the movie and is pivotal in Vladimir's final battle with Kuria. The good sorcerer is characterized in the website as, quote unquote, the personification of old Slavic wisdom, truth, and patience, a revealing statement about the writer's opinion on Rus pantheism and the ties that it has between belief and the Russian identity. Strangely enough, the Slavic deities themselves are characters in the movie. Perun, the thunder god, refuses a sacrifice by Krivja, revealing the crooked sorcerer's evil intentions. More important, however, is the enigmatic rot. In the climactic battle between Vladimir and Kuria, the date protects the Knyaz from the Peshenegaros and ultimately vaporizes Krivja. However, it's not, we do not know if it's actually if rod or God. I'm going to pass for the next slide. This first uh, picture right here is the moment that the rod or God acts. You can see the, it's an oak, an oak is a tree that is associated with a lot of elite Slavic deities, and also Norse. And he is dissipating a curse uh, of literal darkness that Krivja put on Vladimir while he's fighting Kuria. In the climactic battle between Vladimir and Kuria, the date protects the Knyaz from Pechenegaros and ultimately vaporizes Krivja. Yeah, Krivja is turned into dust. Interestingly enough, the earlier piece of dialogue between Bayan and Akhrist and Aleksha seems to imply that Rod is just a Russian interpretation of the Christian God, equating both dates in their natures. Two conclusions can be drawn for this. The first is that in the KV, the relationship between Christianity and Slavic pantheism is not an antagonistic one. Instead, the former would be a resignification of the latter. God would, all, God would have always acted and protected the Russians and the Russians, even when he was called the Rod. Moreover, as our second conclusion, it seems that the move is leaning towards the now controversial concept of vaivieri or double faith, a sort of hybridism between the two systems of belief that shaped the core of modern Russian identity through the 18th and 19th century historiography. Hence, the celebration of both Slavic traditions and Christianity is tied directly to an ideal Rus that traverses smoothly between the two faiths. To conclude, there are other elements Leandro. present in... Leandro, the... okay. what? time's up. Time's uh, up. <laughs> this, is the, this is actually the last uh, paragraph. Sorry, okay. I'm gonna read finish it quickly if you if you want like final phrase. Okay, it's actually the final phrase. There are other elements present in the KV that would warrant analysis. The depiction of Vladimir himself, far from perfect character, but still hiding in some of the more egregious aspects of his record life, is an important aspect of the plot tied to the relationship between the Russians and the Russian Constantine. 
How women are portrayed mostly as love interest and objects of lust can also reveal a way to understand a masculine Russian past. In any case, we hope to have shown that there is a medievalism in the Russian media manifesting itself as an idealized past permeated by some historiographical conceptions. Perhaps more than a medieval apparatus developing for the notion from Pereira and Giacomoni, we could even talk of a driven Russianity apparatus, waiting to be discussed and analyzed in more works. But that is hopefully a task to other historians. Most of the time. These are the references. I'm going to upload this slide in academia.edu. But now, as I ended, I pass the talk to our next presenter, my good friend Lucas Simone, who's gonna present. I think the I paused the share. If you could talk. Who is going to present the conference entitled The Medieval the Construction of Ukrainian Nationality? A look from the public space in the Kievan city. I'm now going to talk in Portuguese. Então, espero que tenham gostado da minha apresentação. Agora eu passo a palavra para o meu bom amigo Lucas Ricardo Simone, da Universidade de São Paulo, doutor pelo Programa de Língua e Literatura Russa, que apresentará a comunicação intitulada O Medievo na Construção da Nacionalidade Ucraniana, o um olhar a partir do espaço público da cidade de Kiev. Lucas, é com você agora, 15 minutos, espero que não ultrapasse que nem eu. Valeu, Leandro, obrigado pela apresentação. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, do you see me? Uh, well, first of all, I would like to apologize in advance for my poor Ukrainian. It is unfortunately not a language I master, but I will need to pronounce a couple of names. And I apologize for the, for the stage of the research. It is definitely a work in progress, so I'm sure that it has several problems and inaccuracies, which I hope to overcome in the near future. Now, on to the presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, uh, a few days from celebrating 30 years as an independent nation, Ukraine is once more under the eyes of international public discussion. Located between the Eurasian steppes and the Carpathians, between the forests of Central Europe and the Black Sea, the country found itself at a critical intersection of geopolitical and economic interests and became a turbulent and disputed area during the present century, with two major contestants struggling for influence over it, the Russian Federation on the one side and the West on the other side, that is the European Union and the United States. Starting in 2004 with the rise of the so-called Orange Revolution, this confrontation had another episode in 2013 during the Euromaidan protests and apparently peaked in 2014, 2015, during the armed conflicts in the Donbass region and the Russian annexation of the Crimea. Nonetheless, the, pa the past year has made it clear that the suspension of hostility hostilities was most likely short-lived and the resolution of the crisis still lies far ahead. This large scale clash between powerful states has obviously influenced domestic debate, echoing an ongoing dispute over the very understanding of Ukrainian nationality and identity. The fierce waters of the Dnipro or Dnieper are certainly not the only ones to divide the country in two halves. Considering exclusively the media coverage, one might easily reach the conclusion that the right bank of the river, with a predominantly Ukrainian speaking majority, leans towards the West, in spite of their nationalist oriented political stance. While in the lands to the East, where Russian is much more widespread as a first language, the population tends to have a less strict view, view on the Ukrainians and a friendlier attitude towards Russia. However, a more thorough investigation into the country's political debate should and definitely would demonstrate that the deep and sharp division of Ukrainian society is much more complex than merely a geographically and linguistically determined altercation of sides aligned with and influenced by foreign powers. As a general rule, along with language and political beliefs, many other elements are combined to form an individual's understanding of belonging, such as creed, class, skin color, etc. However, as interesting as the subject, subject may be, this presentation is much humbler and error in scope and competence. Our goal is to briefly examine Kyiv's public space 
and its relation with medievalist elements in the construction of Ukraine's national identity. This is a process mainly conducted by the central government, by the highest authorities of the country over the past 30 years. And therefore we see fit to take a short overview of the construction of Ukraine's official view on nationality before we tackle the subject. Uh, after the rise of Ukraine as a fully independent nation, along with the task of creating a new administrative structure for the country, the government put in motion a transition process to create a different collective identity and adopt new national symbols, a flag, an anthem, a coat of arms, a currency, public holidays, national heroes, etc. In general, the forging of such complex symbolism relies heavily on oversimplified, ideologically biased and idealized visions, visions of the past and is based on two principles. One affirmative, stating what the country is, and one negative, defining what the country is not. In Ukraine, this is an ongoing process with elements being constantly added and removed as the heated debates on nationality have never cooled down since independence. As in many other post-Soviet states, the main effort in the 1990s was the, to dissociate the country from a Soviet identity with the erasure or attempted erasure of communist symbology and there we say values. But there is also a strong need for denying any ties with both Soviet and pre-revolutionary Russia and with Poland. Hence the semi-official praise of Cossack hetmans like Bohdan Khmelnytsky and Ivan Mazepa, but also of highly controversial leaders of a number of paramilitary groups that fought against both German and Soviet troops during World War II, the most noteworthy of which is definitely Stepan Bandera. Uh, as noted above, language is usually one of the most powerful elements in the process of creating a national identity with both affirmative and negative features. While not always successfully, some modern countries have even attempted to artificially reconstruct dying languages to create a sense of belonging to an uninterrupted tradition. As for Ukraine, the meaning of language as a legitimizing and unifying factor seems to be particularly intense. In the Ukrainian SSR, during most of its 70 year long existence, Russian was favored over Ukrainian, although not entirely in an official fashion. There were, however, some remarkable outbursts outbursts of Ukrainization, especially during the 1920s, briefly in the 1960s, and also in the late 1980s. The status of Ukrainian as an official language, surprisingly to many, goes back to 1989. And since independence, the use of Ukrainian as a first language has been steadily increasing as a result of public policies and programs. In 2017, a controversial bill was passed to make Ukrainian the only accepted language for all levels of education. But after heavy criticism inside and outside the country, the enforcement of the new law was postponed to 2023. Over the last decade, episodes of repression and discrimination against Russian speakers have allegedly become common in the country, even in regions where uh, Ukrainian is not the most widely spoken language. It must be noted, however, that the relation between the two languages is extremely complex with most of the Ukrainian society historically bred in a diagnostic environment, having a rather nuanced attitude towards linguistic expression. Furthermore, there are many gray and undefined areas where surzhik is predominant, a group of dialects or social acts that combine features of both Russian and Ukrainian. This phenomenon poses yet another challenge to political groups attempting to use a supposedly coherent language as a catalyst for national unity. Medieval aspirations are much more distinguishable in the affirmative aspects of Ukraine's national identity construction process. At this point, we must make, make an almost indispensable digression concerning the meaning of the term Middle Ages in the context of East Slavic history. In her highly praised doctoral dissertation entitled Multivalent Russian Medievalism, Old Russia Through New Eyes, Catherine May Rose summed up the problem quite precisely. While talking about Russia, the main argument is also suitable for the Ukrainian scenario. Quote, does Russia even have a middle age? Using such a terminology presupposes not only modernity that comes after, but also antiquity that comes before. And in the Russian case, this is problematic. We are left, no, we are left to question, should we consider the Greek tradition to be Russia's real antiquity inherited through Byzantium via Orthodoxy? Is the earliest stage is the earliest age of Russia's legendary history chronicles that begin, begin with the Genesis story and claim an unbroken lineage from the biblical flood 
part of its medieval period, or is it something separate? This raises an important complication in medieval studies once we expand beyond the traditional European conception as such. What makes something medieval then, if chronology is a faulty metric?" End quote. The author states that her work looks at the medieval, quote, through the prism of a 19th century perspective, looking not at the medieval as a historical phenomenon, so much as the ways in which the conceptual imagined Russian medieval served as a source of inspiration in Russia's modern era. Of primary importance is not what we find to be medieval, but rather what served as inspiration in the medievalist mode that arose during the period of inquiry, inquiry end quote. Therefore, when the Ukrainian idea was conceived in the 1800s, it was only natural considering the zeitgeist to look for the nation's cradle in the Middle Ages. For Ukrainian nationalists in particular, there was an absolutely irresistible temp temptation to see themselves as heirs of ancient Rus, the mighty and culturally sophisticated polity that existed roughly from the 10th to the early 13th century, a federation of East Slavic and Finnic tribes that had its political center precisely in Kiev. The academic groundwork for this conception was laid relatively late by historian Mihailo Khrushchevsky, whose monumental book, History of Ukraine-Rus, published between 1895 and 1933, depicted the Ukrainian people, here is Khrushchevsky, depicted the Ukrainian people as a monolithic entity, almost inextricably bound to the land. We shall return to this topic later on in our presentation. For now, suffice it to say that this idea became deeply rooted uh, in the debate over Ukrainian nationality and played a major role in the creation or recreation of the country's national symbols. Let us consider, for instance, the Ukrainian Trizuk, uh, suggested by Khrushchevsky as the Ukrainian People's Republic, coat of arms in 1917, it represents a trident and is based on the images found in several coins from the late 10th century issued by Prince Volodymyr and his successors. The short-lived independent republic also had as its currency the hryvnia, named after the medieval grivna, ingots of silver or gold used as a monetary unit in ancient Rus. Both symbols were reintroduced in the post-Soviet period the Trizub in 1992 and the Hryvnia in 1996, replacing the highly devalued Karbovanets. Incidentally, most of the Karbovanets banknotes were medieval inspired, depicting the legendary founds, founders of the city, the monastery of the capes and St. Volodymyr Hill. Uh, the medievalist components of this evolving national identity are also substantial in the public space of Kyiv, visible not only in signs and monuments, but also in the names of streets, avenues, and squares. The toponymic decommunization of post-Soviet states, by the way, is a vast subject for research, one unfortunately not fitting in our mod modest presentation. Thus, we shall focus on the former, more specifically on the medieval-inspired monuments located in the capital city. As we understand the question, for the, two last for the last two centuries, Kyiv's urban identity has been intertwined with the construction of national identities, contrasting or outright opposite as they might have been. While churches and other public buildings are also heavily impregnated with collective significance, the most explicit elements in this spatial collection of symbols are monuments. They are three-dimensional secular icons, much like their religious counterparts, that direct the viewer's eyes towards some, some sort of higher reality, intended to be ahistorical and eternal. The places where the monuments are erected become sacralized spaces that could be identified with what Pierre Nora called lieu de mémoire. They are meant to evoke the past, understood here as concrete and tangible, to establish a clear and apparently unequivocal connection between long gone glorious times and the present in an attempt to rebuild, or to put it more precisely, to build a collective memory aligned uh, with present aspirations. Need needless to say that the formation of collective memory is a fierce battlefield, and the past is built, destroyed, and rebuilt periodically, not only after radical changes of governments or regimes, but also through subtle and constant reinterpretation of reinterpretations of history, made both officially and unofficially by the political and social forces involved. The recent wave of iconoclasm against public monuments in the United Kingdom and the United States is a very expressive example of this dispute. Let us now move, uh, move on to the monuments per se. Uh, Kiev has dozens, maybe hundreds of statues spread across the city, many of which refer to pre-modern characters or episodes. Considering the time of our presentation, we shall discuss briefly some of them. 
Two of the monuments we selected are dedicated to Prince Sviatoslav Igorovich, ruler of Rus from the 960s until his gruesome death in 972. 972. The first one is a nine meter tall statue built in 2003 on the Valery Lobanovsky Avenue. Unfortunately, we were not able to identify the artist. The second one was created by Alexei Pergamenchik and erected in 2004 on the so-called Landscape Alley in the historical center of Kiev. Both monuments depict uh, Sviatoslav in a martial position, and the second one quite unnaturally, and give emphasis to the horse, a symbol of Sviatoslav's untamable nature and the will to expand his domains to the southwest towards the Danube. It is interesting to notice that in both statues, uh, but especially in the most recent, the visual representation of the medieval princely prince deliberately rep resembles a 17th century Cossack, much like Klav de Lebedev's famous painting Sviatoslav's encounter with Emperor John. Uh, Lebedev uh, even portrays Sviatoslav wearing a Ukrainian traditional peasant shirt. I'll have to skip a couple of paragraphs because I'm running out of time. Uh, just a moment. The man with the cake. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, medieval inspired monuments in Kyiv is the one dedicated to Princess Olga, Andrew the Apostles, and Saints Cyril and Methodius. Olga was the mother of aforementioned Sviatoslav Igorevich and acted as regent of Rus from rough, for roughly 15 years in the mid 10th century. She was also the first Russian ruler to convert to Christianity under the Greek emperor's influence. The, apost the Apostle Andrew, while not formally Kiev's patron saint, has a great symbolic importance to the city. Uh, according to the primary chronicle, he passed by the side of future Kiev and foresaw its upcoming glory. Finally, Cyril and Methodius were the monks credited for designing the Cyrillic and Glagolitic alphabets in the ninth century and trans translating the Holy Scriptures into Slavic. I have to skip another paragraph and show the last monument. Uh, finally, the almost five meter tall statue of St. Volodymyr on the steep right bank of the river, Kiev's oldest and most famous dock monument. The construction project started in 1843 and was headed by Russian sculptor Pyotr Klot. It was unveiled a decade later in 1853, a moment of rising instability for the empire with the impending Crimean War and the closing of the closing years of the reign of Nicholas I. The statue represents St. Volodymyr, uh, looking over the river and holding an enormous cross on his right hand and the princely crown on his left hand. The high relief figures of the uh, Lucas, were created. Oi. Essa desculpa de interromper, se puder encerrar assim que possível, que a gente já está um pouco no teto. Agora, dois estipulados para cada apresentação. Muito obrigado. Uh, just a second. Uh, in 2015, a fierce controversy arose between the Russian Federation and Ukraine concerning a 24 meter tall statue of, of Vladimir Volodymyr commissioned by the Russian government to be erected on the Sparrow Hills in Moscow, supposedly as a provocative symbol of Russia's triumph in the Crimean War. At the time, only a major backlash from the Muscovite public opinion, mostly because of the negative impact on the city landscape, frustrated the original plans. But the statue was erected regardless on a different spot near the Kremlin and a bit smaller, only 17 meter tall. The Ukrainian authorities responded with a sarcastic message on the country's official Twitter account. Quote, don't forget what the real Prince Volodymyr monuments looks like. Kiev brought Orthodox Christianity to the Rus, kind reminder to add Russia, end quote, followed by a picture of their very own Volodymyr. Final paragraph, far from taking sides in this battle for the past, we restrict, restrict ourselves to quoting Simon Franklin's comment on the subject. Quote, there was no such thing as Russia or Ukraine in the 11th century. Culturally, they are both successors, successors of the Eastern Christian entity, which emerged and flourished in the 10th to 13th centuries. Politically, neither is a direct de uh, descendant, end quote. It is therefore fairly safe, safe to say that both the Ukrainian and the Russian claim to the right of setting a monument to St. Vladimir Volodymyr rely on anachronistic and rather distorted visions of the past. And the historical figure of the Kievan prince would definitely not identify himself as Russian or Ukrainian. In what concerns our presentation, it is worth noticing that the aforementioned tweet contains a particular understanding of Ukrainian nationality. 
direct and connected to Mikhail Khrushchev's ideas discussed above. In this view, the monopoly on the legacy of ancient Rus is an uncompromising feature of the country's national identity, and to some extent, the very le legitimacy of Ukraine as an independent nation seems to derive substantially from it. Thank you. I'm sorry about the time. Thank you, Lucas. It was really interesting. I also have a lot of questions about it. Now I'm going to switch to Portuguese to present the next one. Obrigado, Lucas. Foi não só porque eu estudo Rus, mas eu acho que até para quem não estuda ver isso foi bastante interessante. Eu já tenho diversas perguntas aqui para fazer, dependendo do tempo. E agora passaremos na nossa última apresentação de José Ivson Marques Ferreira de Lima, da UFPE. A apresentação intitulada Chanil e os Unos, uma representação de orientalismo e das masculinidades hegemônicas no filme Mulan, 1998, também conhecido como Aquele que Não é Ruim. Agora eu vou passar para o inglês para apresentar. It was great, Lucas. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to go to the final presentation from José Ibson Marques Ferreira de Lima, from UFPF, Federal University of Pernambuco, entitled Chanil and the Hunt, a representation of Orientalism and Hegemonic Masculinities in the movie Mulan from 1998, also known as The Good One. So, José Ibsen, you have 15 minutes and it's all yours. É, boa tarde, Leandro. Quando estiver faltando cinco minutos, você pode me avisar? Ah, sim, claro, aviso. Obrigado. Deixa eu só é, apresentar aqui a tela. Pronto, está aparecendo para vocês? Tá. Certo. Aí tá aparecendo sua tela, né? Porque eu tô vendo outros botões aqui. Sim, é sua tela. Olha é. é, vou começar, vou apresentar em português, tá? Tô um pouco nervoso para falar inglês, mas de repente se tiver perguntas eu posso responder em inglês. Mas então, prosseguindo. Olá, pessoal. Boa tarde. Meu nome é José Ivesson, Márcio Pereira de Lima. Eu sou aluno do primeiro período do curso de bacharelado em História da Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. Eu sou membro do LEON, o Laboratório de Estudos de Outros Medievos, e estou aqui é, com minha pesquisa sobre o filme Mulan, orientado pelo professor Bruno Shoa. É, o título da minha pesquisa, como já citado, é Xan Yu e os Unos, uma representação de orientalismo e de masculinidades hegemônicas no filme Mulan. Tá. É, eu possuo três objetivos com essa comunicação, no qual, o primeiro, eu vou analisar o filme com o intuito de compreender como a animação estadunidense representa os povos é, da cultura asiática, como chinesa, e os Unos, que, por mais que se chamem Unos, não são os Unos que são conhecidos, né, como foram liderados por Atila, por exemplo. É uma saída, até anacrônica, assim, que eles encontraram, para representar um inimigo asiático sem acabar levantando bandeira. Então, por assim dizer, não sendo tão direto. Então, por Unos, é, é mais uma criação deles mesmos do que os Unos é, são historicamente conhecidos. É, eu vou utilizar o caso desses personagens, né, Shan Yu e os Unos, no geral, mas que estão representados pelo Shan Yu, para discutir sobre o que eles representam nos filmes e, assim, dialogar sobre como estão articulados esses personagens, é, os conceitos que vão servir como a minha base conceitual, que serão as comunidades hegemônicas, orientalismo e medievalismo. Bom, o meu referencial teórico é composto pelo conceito de gênero, o John Scott, na qual, segundo ela, o gênero é um elemento constitutivo das relações sociais, baseado nas diferenças percebidas entre os sexos, e sendo ele uma forma primária de dar significado e representação de poder. Orientalismo, é o conceito que foi ressignificado por Eduardo Said, e primeiramente era utilizado para se tratar de toda a produção é, intelectual, acadêmica, que era feita sobre o, Ocidente, o Oriente, perdão, e é, recebeu uma outra distinção, né, que é toda essa mentalidade que foi criada em cima dessas produções. E, por último, que foi a definição trazida por ele, orientalismo como 
um estilo ocidental para dominar, reestruturar e ter autoridade sobre o Oriente. No geral, o orientalismo é uma visão do outro, é uma visão estereotipada, idealizada, que, por sua vez, é criada pelo Ocidente para o próprio Ocidente. Uh, o orientalismo ele não atua na percepção que os tidos orientais, como é, os povos dos continentes africanos e asiáticos, por exemplo, têm de si. E sim, eles utilizam, sobretudo Europa e, posteriormente, Estados Unidos, para criar uma imagem e, assim, ter autoridade sobre ela, para falar sobre ela, como acontece no filme Mulan, e daí construir toda a imagem, toda a noção que esse Ocidente, né, as Américas e a Europa vão ter, uma compreensão, no caso, vão ter do Oriente, sobretudo culturas chinesas, japonesas, indianas e africanas em geral. Vou utilizar o conceito de masculinidades hegemônicas pela socióloga Howen Connell, na qual ela traz masculinidade não no sentido da, da dicotomia entre masculino e feminino. Ela traz masculinidades como uma hegemonia dentro de si própria, aonde vai existir, vai haver uma pluralidade de masculinidades, aonde haverão masculinidades dominantes e subalternas. E toda a régua, por assim dizer, para ser medida, na qual as dominantes são as masculinidades mais masculinas e as subalternas são as mais femininas. E o conceito de medievalismo que eu estou utilizando aqui, apresentado por Rick Burns e Andrew James Johnson, na qual ele tra eles trazem o conceito como uma investigação das diferentes formas que a Idade Média foi percebida e foi construída por períodos posteriores. É, movendo para o filme, né, o filme ele é inspirado é, em um poema chinês do, do período da dinastia Wei do Norte, por volta do, escrito por volta do século V, VI d.C., que é chamado A Balada de Uamulang e possui a, a mesma história, por assim dizer, do filme, no qual uma jovem assume o lugar de seu pai para, defen para defender a China na guerra. Entretanto, no filme, como já citado, tem é, esse, é, a guerra, no caso, é contra os invasores húmidos. Dentro do conto, a gente não tem isso. Mas o filme em si ele foi produzido em uma época que é compreendida como Renascimento Disney, aonde ela começou com A Pequena Seria, em 1989, e, a partir de Aladdin, em 1992, é, começou a trazer histórias, a gente começou a trazer histórias que fugiam daquele eixo eurocêntrico que era costumeiro de, de suas animações. Mas isso não quer dizer que essas culturas estavam sendo representadas de, da maneira adequada, por assim dizer. No caso de Mulan, após a Disney financiar a distribuição de um filme chamado Kundum, do Marx Cossas, no qual a China entendeu como um filme de propaganda anti-chinesa, é, Mulan recebeu uma nova missão, um novo propósito, que era restabelecer a relação Disney e China e é, fortalecer né, é, essas relações econômicas, por assim dizer. Afinal, a Disney tinha acabado de se recuperar de uma crise intelectual e financeira e a China já estava emergindo no cenário mundial. Né? O, o cinema em si, como ainda continua nos dias de hoje, é muito importante para a bilheteria em si. Então, era um público que a Disney já queria conquistar e Mulan recebeu essa visão, essa missão. Mas isso não quer dizer, mais uma vez, que o filme não incorre de estereótipos, mesmo quando ele houve um estudo por parte da produção para que não acabasse inflamando ainda mais os nervos dos chineses, por assim dizer. Bom, eu vou apresentar agora o meu recorte, que é o personagem Shan Yu, né, que é o líder dos Hunos, 
que é definido pelo seu artista criador e o design dele como um vilão bárbaro, e eu vou explicar isso daqui a pouco, que possui um complexo de superioridade. Ora, o filme, ele, ele traz shang e os Hunos, por assim dizer, como o clássico bárbaro. Eles não têm nenhum propósito para a China, digamos assim. Eles são invasores, eles querem destruir, eles querem matar e só. Não, o filme em si ele não se preocupa em trazer um objetivo bem definido do Xian Yu. É simplesmente citado que a muralha da China, que por sua vez está sendo representada de uma forma bem despótica, né? na qual ela sempre foi grandiosa, ela, a muralha da China nunca foi invadida, né? então sempre foi aquela sociedade homogênea, sempre foi daquele jeito. Então, é, no caso do Xian Yu, quando ele vê a muralha sendo construída, por assim dizer, ele toma como um desafio. Né? E eu vou abordar sobre isso mais tarde. Bom, os Hunos, em geral, eles representam a única variação étnica presente no filme. Como pode ser que poucos de vocês saibam, mas a China ela possui várias etnias. Por exemplo, os Hans, que é a etnia que é a maioria, é a maioria representa a maioria, cerca de 92% atualmente. Temos os Uigur, né, que é a maioria étnica muçulmana. E temos, só para citar algumas, e no caso dos Hunos, em sua iconografia, eles, a, eles aparentam ter uma, um design muito próximo dos Manchus, que é uma minoria étnica que chegou até a governar a China. Bom, e essa variação étnica é problemática dentro do filme porque ela é a única e justamente essa variação étnica vai estar trazendo todo o perigo para a estrutura para a paz e a honra na China, uma vez que honra está sendo tratada de uma forma bem orientalista, porque no filme tudo gira em torno da honra. Né? É um conceito bem repetido. Bom, nele há o conceito de bárbaro, né? que por sua vez está muito ligado com o ideal medieval de bárbaro que foi construído, né? é, de invasores que destruíram Roma e que não trouxeram nenhuma contribuição, por assim dizer, para a, para a sociedade europeia, entre aspas, no geral. Então, inclusive, a propriedade média ela é criada pelos, é um termo criado pelos modernos para falar de um tempo médio, né? um tempo aonde houve um declínio, né? aonde a Europa foi dominada é, não só por invasões dentro da Europa, inter-europeias, como também no caso dos muçulmanos, né? que também tinha uma influência mongol, por exemplo. É, os Hunos, é, eles representam o povo das estepes asiáticas. Apesar de possuir esse nome, eles estão representando justamente esses povos nômades que viviam em guerra com a China e que, inclusive, chegaram a instalar algumas dinastias, como foi o caso da Wei do Norte, Inclusive, dentro do conto, deixa claro o título de Khan, do imperador da China, presente no poema da balada de Wamulan. E os mongóis, já citados, né, que eram também povos nômades que viviam é, pelas estepes. Bom, é, todo o filme ele é produzido com ideias que são próprias e contemporâneas de quem está produzindo. É, a Disney é estadunidense. Então, é, nesse período, eles já viviam uma série de tensões com povos do Oriente Médio, né? assim como a gente acompanha até o dia de hoje. Então, todas essas relações já estavam bem inflamadas e os próprios Hunos, eles são essa representação do terrorista, né? do terrorista, por assim dizer, porque eles só querem destruir e acabar com a estabilidade econômica, com a, a paz daquela sociedade. Mas, então, seguindo é, para a minha última fala, eu acredito que os conceitos de orientalismo e de medievalismo já estão bem trabalhados, 
Então, eu vou tratar aqui o filme como uma disputa entre masculinidades, como as próprias imagens estão trazendo. Né? Xan Yu, no final do filme, ele verbaliza né, a questão que eu falei sobre ele ver como um desafio em seu já citado complexo de superioridade a criação da muralha da China né, como uma grandiosa defesa, inclusive essa visão das muralhas da China como impenetráveis e grandiosa é também uma visão orientalista, porque as muralhas da China, ao longo de várias dinastias, foram atacadas, foram destruídas, e houveram algumas dinastias que nem sequer reformavam. A que temos hoje em dia é, foi construída por volta da dinastia Ming, né? isso já na, no que na Europa seria compreendido como idade moderna. Então, o próprio filme em si, ele não traz, uma, citando brevemente, uma temporalidade assim, bem definida, né? um recorte temporal bem definido. Ele vai possuir diversos elementos que, sobretudo, é, vão ser mais predominantes, elementos da dinastia Tang, Bom, por assim dizer. Mas, então, voltando para essa disputa entre nossas comunidades, o filme constitui uma jornada do herói, uma jornada na qual a Mulan, através da masculinidade, ela vai subir esses degraus, né? por assim dizer, e vai, através dessa experiência, ser ela mesma, né? aprender sobre quem ela é. E isso está dialogando muito com influências de trabalhos como Judith Butler, por exemplo, que nessa época já estava bem presente nesse mundo. Mas, retomando, é porque é uma disputa entre masculinidades porque dentro da a, a própria invasão dos Hunos é predominantemente masculina, né? não tem Hunos mulheres. Né? Então, os chineses, quando se unem para defender, e até as canções são sempre voltadas como, no inglês, a canção que ele canta é Eu farei um homem de você, né? eu irei me tornar um homem. Então, como vocês podem ver nas imagens, está sempre tendo esse confronto entre masculinidades, seja do Xan Yu com o imperador, seja com o Lixang e Xan Yu, ou com Mulan, a nossa heroína, que vai derrotar Xan Yu, né, que vai ser essa força incontrolável, essa masculinidade destrutiva, e vai, por assim dizer, sendo ela o maior exemplo de masculinidade. Mas, então, seguindo para minhas considerações finais, o filme Mulan apresenta os anos os Hunos e seu líder Xan Yu, é, como é, representa não somente o perigo para o despotismo chinês, né, como eu já falei, como a variação étnica, étnica no filme, e representa o um contexto medieval do bárbaro, cujo único objetivo é invadir, destruir e desonrar a China. O orientalismo é uma constante no filme, pois é ele que vai definir todas as ideias sobre o que é ser homem, sobre o que, por sua vez, é muito ligada não à ideia de ser homem na China, mas à ideia de ser homem para a sociedade estadunidense. Né? É no seu país de gênero e de dessa representação de masculinidade e de medievalismo em si. Então, apesar de ser feito com o de não ofender a cultura chinesa em geral, os hunos possuem diversos estereótipos dos quais estão presentes em outras produções, sobretudo na Disney, por exemplo. Como eu já citei, o design é muito voltado para os manchus, sendo o Fu Manchu, por exemplo, um dos maiores exemplos de estereótipo orientalista do cinema, não só do cinema, como também da literatura. Então, com isso, encerro a minha, a minha comunicação. É, espero que tenham gostado e espero que tenham perguntas. Estarei bastante satisfeito em respondê-las. Podem perguntar em inglês também. Isso aqui são as minhas bibliográficas. E é isso. Agradeço a todos pela atenção. É, thank you, José Ibsen. Muito obrigado, José Ibsen. And now we're going to go to the questions, if there are any here. If there are no, I'm going to wait for 30 seconds. If there are no, and I have some questions to ask for the panelists, except myself, of course. So, I, uh, instead of waiting, I think it would be better if I ask it. 
Tá, eu vou fazer primeiro a questão em inglês, para depois fazer... Não, melhor primeiro fazer em português para o público se situar, aí depois eu vou para o inglês e vocês respondem, se concordam. So, first I will ask the questions in Portuguese, and then I will to situate the public, who is majorly Brazilian and goes often, and then I'm going to jump to English so you can ask. So, então, tá. Minha primeira questão, na verdade, eu tenho para os três, vai para o Pedro. Eu gostei bastante da apresentação, sobre como essa medievalística, não no sentido, de, um pouco no sentido do medievalismo, mas mais no sentido de historiografia sérvia, trata Kosovo como se não tivesse o medievo. E o que eu queria perguntar se ele poderia falar um pouco mais sobre, se eu entendi bem, um uma comissão de grupos éticos presentes na historiografia sérvia e também um pouco na albaniana, ou albânia, realmente não sei como é o pátrio. Isso também ele pode falar um pouco de como a historiografia de Kosovo trata desse passado deles. Para o Lucas, foi uma apresentação também sublime, eu gostei bastante, eu teria duas perguntas. A primeira, eu acho que um pouco mais óbvia para o público brasileiro, você mostrou o Trisup, que é aquele tridente associado à dinastia Rurikida, se é que podemos chamar de dinastia Rurikida depois do artigo do Ostrovski que contesta tudo. E eu acho que está na memória de alguns brasileiros que se lembram de algumas passeatas da extrema-direita brasileira em que esse tridente foi levantado sendo um símbolo ressignificado pelo grupo de extrema-direita ucraniana. Eu esqueci o nome ucraniano de direita. Sei que é o setor de direita. Acho que é Pravi Sector. É, Pravi Sector. Gostaria que você falasse um pouco desse uso do passado ucraniano, se você sabe, pela extrema-direita ucraniana, e também perguntar se... Porque o que você falou, basicamente, foi com essas estátuas, eles estão tentando resgatar o passado russo. Só que é o passado russo que também pertence à Rússia. Belarus, eles não ligam muito para esse passado, exceto Polotsk, por alguma razão. Nós já temos já para os próximos eventos de medievalismo aí. Mas, enfim, eu queria saber se... Você sabe se houve intensificações dessa disputa por um passado, um passado realmente russo, sobre quem pertence ao russo, em momentos de tensão entre a Rússia e a Ucrânia. Duas ocasiões me vem à cabeça agora. A primeira é a anexação da Crimeia. Nós temos até o Putin falando a Crimeia sempre foi parte da Rússia, se bem que eu acho que em russo ele falou Crimeia sempre parte de russo, ele falou como se fosse russo. E com as novas agressões, contra-agressões que estão acontecendo, infelizmente, nesse ano, com até brigas da OTAN e tal... Está quase uma terceira guerra lá. Se você vê uma intensificação desse, de quem é o passado... E para o José Ibson, eu gostei Leandro, bastante. Oi. Eu posso te interromper um momentinho? Boa tarde. Em, em função do tempo, que nós só temos mais 18 minutos nessa sala, é. eu peço que vocês... Que quem for fazer uma pergunta, faça uma pergunta mais direta e uma resposta um pouquinho mais, um, direta também, para termos tempo de ao menos a, termos a possibilidade de termos mais esse jogo de perguntas e respostas, e qualquer coisa, haverá uma outra sala aberta para continuar essa discussão. Eu, eu sinto muito por isso, mas... Ah, sim, sim. Assim. Não, perdão, tá uh, certo. Ok. Eu uh, acho que eu vou... Do you, can you translate uh, what I say to, to all the participants? Yeah, I can. So, I'm gonna ask the questions briefly now in, in English, so we can that. The first one is to Bedri. If you could talk a bit more about this ethnic commission that the Serbian and the Albanian historiography goes to the region of Kosovo, and if you also could talk about how Kosovian historiography is treating its own medieval past. Well, Lucas, if you could also talk a bit more about the Trisub and its relationship to the far right, extremely Ukrainian, because for those not from Brazil, I don't know if you know, but someone in a far right protest actually rose the private sector, the right sector, uh, 
nationalist far right Ukrainian group in the Brazilian protest. And also, if you could talk about if the if there is any intensification of wanting the past to be dead of both Russia and Ukraine in times of fight, I was thinking mostly about the Crimean, I'd say the second Crimean war of 2014 and the current aggressions. And also for Jose Ibsen, I have a, a question. I don't know if we can ask or not, but it's to think, it's to think at least you talked about how honor is important throughout the movie. And I know very little about Asian history in general, especially China, but it seems that this overly attention to the aspect of honor, wouldn't it, take, it be on itself um, a kind of orientalism? If we think about, for example, the book, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword by the author whose name I forgot, but I have read twice, there is this stereotype that the Asian is tied to honor and honor is everything to them. If you can see this correlation, thank you all. I'm sorry for taking too long to ask. So you can start, Bedri. Please. You can start if you want to start answering the question. No, I don't have any questions. Oh, no, I asked you a question about how I'm going to only keep this one so the debate can move further and we, since we're lacking time. If you know how the historiography from Kosovo is dealing mm -hmm. with its medieval past, if you can answer that, please. Uh, yes, the uh, um, historiography of Kosovo now try to explain that the people of Kosovo are um, in the middle of this and in, in middle age and early middle or in Kosovo of course time where uh, 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 where where they live in their territory so they are autochthonous in this in their territory and but history of Yugoslavia wanted to show that the, the, before the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, the territory of Kosovo, who, in territory of Kosovo, doesn't exist uh, Albanian people because they, they are, uh, they are when the uh, Empire Ottoman came to the Kosovo in the uh, in middle of the 14th century, and. And another issue is that the Battle of Kosovo, which happened in 1389, the Serbians authors uh, tried to, to see that battle, uh, only the people Serbian who particip participated in that battle against the Ottoman Empire. But uh, the facts are, there are too many facts that explain that the people uh, they, uh, in the Kosovo, uh, at that time, uh, they are gathered many peoples of Balkans uh, as a coalition together and to protect the, in, the Ottoman conquest. And also, there are one princess, Albanian princess, who died in this battle. Uh, the name is Theodor Mozaka. He came from the south of territory of Albania from the Berat and they comes to the Kosovo in Battle of Kosovo, which happened near in Pristina. And as you know, Pristina is now capital city of Kosovo. And the other, all of, of this issue, you'll, you'll present it in the paper, in full paper. Okay, thank you, Bedi. Now, Lucas, if you could answer us. Uh, English or Portuguese? Uh, English, right? If you can do both fast, <laughs> but preferably <laughs> English. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the Prave, Prave sector 
and Russian probably sector in Ukrainian. It's a very delicate debate and I try to avoid that during the presentation due to some unexpected um, influences of the Ukrainian debate over our political debate. So I try to avoid that uh, discussion uh, in my presentation. But um, they're obviously one of the most uh, outstanding examples of medievalism and uh, me uh, uses and abuses of medieval symbolism or uh, intended, intendedly medieval symbolisms um, in Ukraine. And uh, for instance, you talked about the um, Trizup, right? There is a famous uh, picture of um, one of the leaders of the Nachtigall uh, battalion that was a collabor collaborationist uh, um, armed force, Ukrainian armed force during World War II. And the, the German official and the Ukrainian official are bo both holding the, the Ukrainian flag with the Trizup. So it does have some, um, uh, let us say, uh, complex connotations, right? Uh, but it's interesting that it was suggested as a national symbol by a socialist, right? Mikhailo Khrushchevsky was uh, basically, um, he was one of the founders of the Revolutionary Socialist Party in, in, in Ukraine. And uh, back in 1917, he su suggested five or six other um, symbols for the new Ukrainian People's Republic. And the Trizup was, um, let us say, arbitrarily chosen, right? So uh, there could have been something else like a, a Kobza or a Bandura. He suggested a couple of other, of other elements. But being a historian, he and uh, medievalist, let's put it this way, he had uh, some kind of uh, favoritism over the medieval uh, themes. And in interesting, interestingly, his, his book is called History of the Ukraine Dash Rus, right? So it's not Ukrainian Rus or Ukraine space Rus. So he, he basically is championing a, a vision of Ukraine and Rus as the same thing. And this, and this um, interpretation basically is what motivates modern nationalist um, movements, including uh, far-right movements and uh, let's say neo, almost neo-Nazi movements, right? Um, I don't think if I answered both questions, but I, so I deliberately try to avoid the, the political debate over the, the symbols, but obviously it's uh, directly re related to the, to the presentation. And it's not our fault. It's the, always the far right's fault to <laughs> taking the symbols and making that explode. <laughs> Thanks. Now, Jose Ibsen, if you could answer. É, então, Leandro, segundo o escritor sino-americano, professor de diásporas asiáticas, Shen Ma, ele diz que honra é um conceito orientalista porque ele é muito recorrente nessas obras. Então, é como ele explica, o orientalismo presente no filme Mulan é, está presente na icono, é, nos ícones animados, como o Mushu, que é o dragão, o cavalo, nos inanimados, né, a Grande Muralha, a, a Cidade Proibida, e no Grilo, por exemplo, que, por sua vez, é por conta do filme O Último Imperador. E, no caso, nas relações pessoais. né? Então, essas relações pessoais, se você assistir o filme, você vai ver, é, novamente que diga, é, você vai perceber que honra é a única temática tratada pela sociedade em si. Tudo se limita e tudo se define na honra. E isso é muito presente nessas adaptações europeias, por exemplo, europeias, americanas, por assim dizer. Então, quando você assiste produções é, chinesas, por exemplo, honra, eu realmente eu estou assistindo uma série chamada 
tem um Temer, um indomável, e honra é raramente mencionado, porque não é o que está definindo ali os personagens nem as relações que eles estão tendo. Aí, justamente por isso, e justamente como você apresentou não é, no livro, que é justamente essa ideia de que a honra, os chineses estão ligados, os asiáticos estão ligados à honra, assim como a honra está ligada a eles. Então, o orientalismo se faz através disso, porque dessa repetição acaba se criando o um estereótipo. É, acredito que eu espero ter respondido a pergunta. Respondeu sim, inclusive, se a gente quiser continuar o diálogo no outro link que o Luiz gentilmente postou. Agora vou ver se há outra pergunta aqui no chat. I'm going to see if there's any question. And that is to me, actually. A question from Carolina Rocha. He's asking if I could explain better the concept of dual faith mentioned in my presentation and how it's on practice. Uh, I could talk a lot about not only this concept, but how this concept was created. But it would not only take a lot of time, but I think it was done much, much better by a British historian, Stella Rock. So I will, Stella Rock, I don't know why I pulled my Russian out of my gut. In any case, it, if when talking about the Vivieri and talk about the, the dual faith, it's common to think about a syncretism, however, a syncretism that is somewhat the equivalent, no more characteristics of one religion than the other. It's a full thing. For example, there are tales and chronicles and geographies that some, of, some village in, I think it was North Russia, instead of becoming Christians, they instead added Jesus as a pagan deity. And you have constantly according to a historiography and also to folklorists, mostly starting from the 18th and 19th century, that there was a war against these syncretic practices, but that these syncretic practices are what are the soul of the Russian people. And then come, I don't think Stella Rocker was the first one. I know she quotes the text from professor now retired Yves Levin whose text I have not been able to get so far, but she also criticized it. And Stella Rock, she just traces the historiography of this, saying that it's much more a historiographical desire to have this national unity of the people than a practice thing in general. If there was such thing as a, how it gives on practice, I would say, let us compare to Candomblé, for example, because it would be something that really Look at a lot. It, that said, there is, a, there is actually a Brazilian article about the Vivieri done with this syncretism in mind. It's from, I think, Ludmila Zwick. I can send you later. It's a good article, though she does not, from what I remember, use this historiographical perspective of Stella Rock. But it's a really really nice article when it's in Portuguese with this most astonishing of all. Thank you, Carol. I hope I have answered your question. I don't know if there are any other, if also the panelists want to ask anything to each other. Uh, Leonardo. Yes. I was going to ask you whether the emphasis on Vladimir uh, by the by the Russian government, the statue, the 24 meter tall statue, the uh, the uh, the cartoon, the the movie Viking, right, released in 2015. Uh, does it have something to do with uh, with uh, an attempt to establish a an orthodox connection to uh, or to ancient truths, more than a political one. Okay, thanks, Lucas, for the question. It's an excellent question because I'm gonna say yes. Kind of, it's kind of obvious. However, it's subtle because this cartoon, as I said, it was 
Previous, it was first planned as a series of short movies about European conversions, Hungary, England, uh, and other places. And they, the director said he could not because it was starting to get fights and people would pend, uh, and etc. So they chose to focus only on Vladimir. Also, originally the movie was going to be about Vladimir's conversion, but it was turned into a two-part movie, first depicting his pagan life and then his Christianity. But as I said, the studio went bankrupt and we only have the first one, the non Christian. But yeah, I believe it does have um, also an orthodox connotations. If you pay attention to when especially these were done, uh, the excuse statue, me. Uh, sorry to sorry to interrupt, but we are out of time. Yes. So I would like to thank you all for attending and presenting at our session. And we would also like to invite you all to our next session, which would be um, between medieval and medievalism starting now. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I believe when I leave the session, uh, it will terminate it, but hey, you're welcome to stay and try to keep the discussion.